Church. So glad that you've allowed us into your home once again for Church at Home. And if you are watching this on Sunday morning, then over at our campus today, our folks are meeting and are observing the Lord's Supper today, that amazing ordinance that Jesus gave us to do until he comes again, the remembrance of his broken body and his shed blood for us. And today that's going to be the subject of uh, my message as well. And I want to encourage you, if, again, if you're watching on Sunday morning and you'd like to physically participate in the Lord's Supper today, uh, then we have a service tonight at 630. And it's a mask only service, but you can come and you can participate physically in the Lord's Supper tonight if you'd like to. Uh, we're looking forward today to looking in the book of 1 Corinthians and talking about the meaning of uh, this incredible ordinance. So again, glad you guys joined us today. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump right in to the scriptures today and to worship today. Father, we come to you today, and we are indeed, uh, we're just so grateful uh, for your love for us. And we're grateful today that uh, as we open your word, we're going to read about your grace, and we're going to see in this ordinance that you left us, this beautiful picture of what you have truly done for us, grace from the past, grace for the present, and, and grace for the days ahead. And Father, we're anxious for your coming one day, and Lord, you've told us that we are to continue uh, to remember you until you come. And so Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these folks that are watching today. I pray today would be an encouragement, uh, and Lord, that you would be lifted up and you'd be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, let's sing together and then open God's Word. I want to introduce a new song to you this morning called Goodness of God. And the chorus says, All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And isn't that the truth? If you've walked with God for any time at all, have you not? found him faithful. In fact, the word says that even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot fail his children. He cannot be faithless to his children. He is a good God. So I will sing of the goodness of God. Mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice have led me through the fire and in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God cause your goodness 
race is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. You have been faithful And all my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son Who drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Once your enemy Now seated at your table Jesus, thank you sacrifice I've been brought near your enemy you've made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no end your blood away my sin Jesus thank you the Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus thank you
washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Once your enemy Now seated at your table Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank As we consider the Lord's Supper today, I want to read a testimony uh, from a person that I, I found this week. And he, he says, growing up, you could call me a cultural Christian. I was in church every Sunday morning. I believed that God loved me and Jesus died for me. I believed the Bible was God's word. I believed in a God who heard me and I prayed would forgive my sins when I asked him to. The way my religious beliefs played itself out was that every Monday through Saturday, I spent the week accumulating a list of sins against God, drinking, partying, pride, sleeping around, etc. Each night, I'd ask God to forgive me for those sins, and I knew we were good until the next day when I started filling up my proverbial whiteboard again. And that was good and fine for day-to-day -day spiritual maintenance, but I firmly believed Sunday I needed to go to church so that I'd remain on God's good list. I believed religion was something you were supposed to do in order to remain on God's good side because, you know, the good people go to church and those are the people that God loves. So I had my nightly forgiveness chat with God, my weekly attendance check at church, and then I had an occasional event at church that made me feel really good about my standing with God. And that was the Lord's Supper. Fast forward several years. And I, for the first time in my life, fully understood what it meant for me to be a sinner and to be truly in need of Jesus as Savior. Now, instead of coming to God each night with head held low in shame, I began meeting with him in the morning, my head held high in gratitude. Instead of attending church out of obligation, I became part of the church out of delight and a desire to be connected to the people of God. And then communion. Instead of communion being some rote religious ceremony with tasty bread, communion became my regular reminder that Jesus loved me enough to die for me, that my sin put Jesus on the cross, that he was pierced for my transgressions, crushed for my iniquities. Communion became my reminder that this body was broken for me, that his blood was shed for me, that upon him was the punishment that brought me peace, and by his wounds, I was healed. It became my reminder that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And you know, I have to confess that my thoughts about the Lord's Supper growing up, maybe you too, were very much the same. And I've come through the years to recognize this time not as a religious exercise, but as a picture and a reminder of grace. And really, the Lord's Supper is all about grace. You know, there, there's a past, a present, and a future aspect to the Lord's Supper. Grace shown to us in the past, grace that we need in the present, and grace that is on the way in the future. So that's how I want to look at it today. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. And again, I know you guys are not going to be able to participate right now, and so uh, I want to give you a little more detail than what uh, than uh, what I would ordinarily do, but we're going to be quick this morning. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul here is writing to a church that he had planted all the way back in Acts chapter 18. Now, he's been gone from Corinth 
for some time, but he's begun to hear rumors that the church is acting crazy, as only churches can do, right? So Paul writes a letter, and he rebukes them. He corrects them. Uh, it kind of It's like a kid, right, who, who misbehaves at school and brings home a note telling his parents that he did something wrong. That's not a fun experience, right? And so here, this is what's happening. Paul is like the teacher, and he sent a note home, right, to the church at Corinth. Now, we're going to pick up in verses 17, and I'm going to read right now down to verse 34. <clears throat> it says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest when you come together for judgment and the rest I will set in order when I come. Uh, sometimes we, we say, well, you know, if we could just go back and be like the New Testament church, right? And yet we read here the New Testament church wasn't perfect either, were they? In fact, they had made a mess of the Lord's Supper. And churches are, are never perfect. They never have been perfect because Christians uh, are not perfect. Perfect, And so this is a situation here in Corinth. These folks were divided. They were divided over preferences, what they liked, what they didn't like, what you could do, what you couldn't do. They were divided over interpretations of Jesus' teachings, applications of Old Testament law. Uh, they were divided over race relations, over politics, uh, class, uh, education, income, all these things uh, they were struggling with. And they're supposed to be coming together for the Lord's Supper, for an ultimate show of, of unity around Christ. Uh, for them, this wasn't just a quick, uh, you know, a piece of bread and, and, a, and a cup of juice. But in this day, it was an entire dinner. And the rich and the poor, the conservative and the liberal, the, the tax collectors and the zealots were all sitting down together. And, and, and this meal would culminate in the Lord's Supper that was to be an incredible show of unity in the church around Jesus. But instead of that happening, evidently, uh, the rich folks were showing up early. And they would eat all of the good food, and they'd end up getting drunk, Paul says, and by the time the poor showed up, there wasn't nothing left but potato salad, right? And so this is going on, among other things, in the church at Corinth. Therefore, the very thing, right, that was supposed to be the symbol of unity under Christ, the Lord's Supper, had become for this church an occasion for division. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but when I read off those areas of division for the church in Corinth, I'm reminded, man, that the Bible always has application to today, right? Because we wrestle with some of the same kinds of division, particularly right now uh, in, in the history uh, of, the, of, uh, of our nation right now, what's going on around us. Um, Paul had earlier said, he said, we who are many are one body, for we all partake 
of one bread. And, you know, another way of, of saying that is that, that Paul is saying we're, we're all messed up, we're all sinners, and we all need a Savior. And communion was supposed to be that physical demonstration of the unity of the church. In fact, it should have been something that was different than anything the world had to offer, the kind of unity in the middle of diversity that, diversity that the world had never seen before. And yet, at least here in Corinth, it is certainly not that. What it should have been, right, is the people of God in the middle of their diversity, in the middle of things that they really uh, didn't always agree on, but they could come together united under the banner of the gospel and say, we are equally sinful, but man, we are equally loved. We are equally loved. And that's what the Lord's Supper proclaims. It's the place, you guys, where we all find grace. And so let's look, first of all, at the past aspect of, of grace, the past aspect of grace. Now, this is verses 23 through 26. How was grace displayed to us in the past? Well, 2,000 years ago, grace took the name of Jesus and died on the cross for our sins. Grace was given at the cross, and grace is received when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that, that, that Jesus Christ, grace incarnate, died on the cross for us and was raised again through the physical sight, smell, taste, touch of the bread and of the wine. It is a reminder of the grace that was displayed for us, listen, 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Jesus' body broken for you. Jesus' blood shed for you. Have you, have you ever wondered why the symbols are bread and wine? Right? Why not? Why not something else? I want you to think about this aspect for just a moment. And that's a deep subject, but I want you to think about this aspect. And this is something that, that I read this week, so I'm going I'm to kind of read it to you. It said, bread must be broken in order to be received. What better symbol of suffering can you have than that? Bread from the beginning until consumption appears to involve suffering. As a seed, it's first thrown in the ground, cut up and buried in cold clay. It rises and endures freezing cold and scorching heat. It ripens, and then it is cut down, gathered, thrown onto the barn floor, and grain is threshed out by severe beating. Grain is then taken and crushed between stones until it has been bruised into fine flour. And then just when the suffering seems over, it is laid out on the table only to be broken into pieces to be eaten and then broken again by teeth, right? And then the wine, not much different. It is pruned and cut and labored over and gathered and thrown into a wine press and crushed beneath trampling feet where the juices freely flow, all a picture of Christ's body and blood as he is being beaten and squeezed and pressed and broken as his precious blood would flow for our salvation. Can you guys see it there? Do you see it? bread and wine are the perfect emblems, the perfect symbols of the intense suffering that Jesus would endure for us on the cross? And he sets them before us. He set them before the disciples, and he's setting them before us and saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. So, when we take communion, we should always remember the display of grace in the past at the cross. But here, here, this is such a great thing. Grace was not just a one-time event whereby we have been given a certain amount, right? And, and we must budget that lest we run out, right? Uh, the, the, the fear that we can use too much grace, that we've got to get more grace somewhere else. And that leads us, I think, to the second aspect of grace. There's a past aspect, but there is a present aspect of grace that we see in the Lord's Supper. And this is verses 27 through 32. Now, uh, to be very clear in those verses, Paul did not say that we had to be worthy to partake in the Lord's Supper. Don't misunderstand those verses there. There's no one that is worthy of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's none that does good, that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in that boat. He said here that we should partake in a worthy manner. Now, when it says unworthily there, that word is an adverb, 
and not an adjective, okay? It's not describing uh, us. We are always unworthy. We are. We're always unworthy, and that's the adjective. But we can eat, we can partake in the supper unworthily, okay? That's the adverb. When our lives don't align with the Jesus that we claim to follow, or we eat in a way that is not respectful. Uh, Tim Keller, uh, he said it this way. He said, obviously the Lord's Supper is not for perfect people, but for repentant people. But that is just the point. The Lord's Supper forces us to keep our inner experience linked with our outward behavior. It demands that we ask, am I truly living a life of gratitude and obeying God as I would be if I really believed he saved me at the infinite cost of his only son? Am I loving others sacrificially as I would be if I really believed I was saved by a sacrificial love? Guys, examining ourselves, as Paul talks about here, means that we should truly ask the question when we partake of the Lord's Supper, do what I say I believe and the way I'm actually living really line up? And if, that, if not, then we ought to repent. We ought to repent of that. To take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner means, or in a worthy manner, that means that we need to do three things. We need to examine our hearts. We need to judge ourselves accordingly, he says here. And then we need to confess our sins to the Lord. Okay, examine our hearts, judge ourselves accordingly, and confess our sins to the Lord before we partake in the Lord's Supper. Self-examination, guys, think about this. Self-examination is not a door that is meant to shut you out from taking communion. You know, I, I, I'm sinful, therefore I can't, I can't take it. I'm not, I'm not able to take it. But rather, it is a door. Self-examination is a door at which you pause and you see whether or not you're in the right condition to enter. And if you are not, then you stop, you get right with God, and then you enter, okay? Now, the thing I really want to focus on today is the opportunity that Jesus gave us in the observation of the Lord's Supper to experience His present grace, grace right now. In verse 28, it says that this is a great time, Paul says, to examine ourselves. And again, not to try to make ourselves worthy of the sacrifice. That's the reason there was a sacrifice, okay? We're not, uh, we are not worthy. But to allow him to strip away all the chains of our sin. To be broken over our sin and to reach up and appropriate the incredible forgiveness and the incredible grace that he offers. And for him to continue his work of cleansing and his work of change in our lives. There's an opportunity for that when we partake in the Lord's Supper. And that begins with confession and, and honest self-evaluation. Now, guys, I've learned something in, in years of, of ministry, and I'm going to say this, and I, and I believe it to be true really for all of us. Most of us refuse to do honest self-evaluation. Most of us refuse to do honest self-evaluation. We, we make ourselves too busy. We run from one trip to the other, one outing to the next. We overwork and we overmedicate to try and escape looking at ourselves and what we really feel and how, uh, what we know deep down inside about ourselves. We may even find friends that will validate us even when we are wrong and we'll avoid church, and we'll avoid anyone that loves us enough to tell us the truth about ourselves. If we're alone, the TV is on, our music is blaring, so that we don't have to face ourselves or think too deeply about our choices. Now, guys, I just know that to be true. Through years of ministry, I've watched person after person, family after family, stay so busy, so busy moving, so so busy doing things, so busy uh, just covering up the struggles in their own life and never really stopping and never really doing any solid self-examination of their own spiritual life. Guys, the Lord's Supper is a built-in opportunity to do it. Because you got to kind of be quiet to do this, right? you got to kind of stop. And you got to focus in order to do this. 
in Scripture, there is this ongoing picture of the brokenness of humanity and our brokenness over our sin. Uh, you guys might remember in the Beatitudes, there is the, this verse that says, blessed are those that mourn. And, and that seems confusing to us, right? How can one who is mourning, how can that be, how can that bring blessing, right? Because mourning generally comes over something bad that's happened. So how can it bring blessing? And what are we broken over? What are we mourning about? And how does that end up in blessing? Well, clearly we are broken, right? We're broken over our sin. And we're broken over the consequences of our sin. I don't have to tell you guys uh, the consequences of sin, do I? You can look at your own life. You can look at the world around us and you can see the devastation that comes with the, with the stupid stuff, right, that we do, the sins that, that we allow into our lives. But guys, if we confess and repent of it, knowing what is waiting for us on the other side of repentance is not judgment, but grace. Grace for today. Blessed are those who mourn for, anybody know the rest of that verse? For they shall be what? They shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. That word means to, to come alongside of you. There'll be one that will come alongside of you. The idea is that when you are broken before God, when you are confessing your sins, when you're broken over the consequences of your sins, that God sends his Holy Spirit, his presence to be with you. And that presence brings blessing. So, so sin, man, it definitely separates us it damages our fellowship with God. But when you cry out to him, God, I no longer want to live this way. I confess my sins to you. I want to repent of my sins. I want to turn. I want my attitude to change, my heart to change. God's spirit then comes alongside of you, the Bible says, in comfort and blessing and brings revival to your heart and a restoration to your life. It's like the... Uh, it's like the son in the, in, the, in the parable of the prodigal son who comes home to his father, right? He's been away and he comes home to his father and, and he just wants to be a servant, right? He comes wanting to confess his sin. He wants just to come and be a servant. But the father who meets him on the road gives him a robe and a ring and puts shoes on his feet and he throws a big party for him. And that's not the only parable like that. And these are parables about how God treats us when we come home to him, this is how God deals with us when we are mourning and when we are broken over our sin. You're part of the family. Like this prodigal son, you're part of the family. All that you lost is being restored to you. Would that be a good thing for you today? Right to come to the end of yourself, to cry out to God, to say to him, God, I'm broken. God, I need help. I confess my sin before you and have God restore to you everything that has been lost. Man, would that be a blessing to you? Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Man, right now, you might be watching this. And you might say, man, Brother Steve, I am away from God right now. And man, in all this pandemic, I've been away from the the church, and, and I've been away from support, and I've allowed sin to creep into my life, and my attitude stinks, and I've done some stuff, and I've said some stuff, and it's gotten my heart all messed up and dirty. I don't want to say to you, if that's you, you're not alone today. You are not alone. Don't let that be a closed door to approaching God, but realize that it can be a door to, to blessing. It can be a door to newness and restoration in your life if you are willing to confess it and repent of it and find the grace for today that he offers to us. And so today, one of the questions simply this, examine yourself. Here's some important questions. Do you have any idols in your life right now? Are you worshiping something other than Almighty God? Is there anyone that you need to forgive or to ask forgiveness? Have you hurt your spouse? Have you said something to somebody that you need to apologize for? Do you need to grant forgiveness to someone maybe that has hurt you? Is there a sin in your life that God has made you aware of 
that you haven't dealt with yet. And what I want to say to you is this, man, there's grace awaiting you, and it's grace awaiting you today, right now. Well, there's a third aspect, and the third aspect of grace here is the future aspect. And again, we find this in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We are to observe the Lord's Supper, to approach uh, this place of grace, right, that he's given us, and we're to do that for how long? Until he comes, right? Until he comes. The return of Jesus is the ultimate hope of every Christian. It is the anticipation that just as Jesus has died on the cross, that he did not stay dead, right? That he is resurrected and that one day he is coming back to fix everything that is broken. That one day he will wipe away every tear from every eye. One day every sad thing will become untrue. One day justice will roll down like waters. One day righteousness will flow like like mighty streams. One day your pain will cease to exist and every bit of that pain will be replaced with joy. Man, the future grace that the Lord's Supper is preparing us for is the return of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but man, I think it could be soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So we find grace. Grace expressed in the past. Jesus died in your place, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ for you. We find grace in the present. We still need that grace every day, and it is offered to us every day as we repent and draw near to Him, and with it comes His presence and blessing. And we have grace for the future. The ultimate results of His grace are still to be seen. I want to go back as we conclude today to the testimony that I read earlier. I wonder if you would be honest enough today to say, you know, as you read that testimony, I felt like it it could be me. Because how I approach life is that God is just a daily magic genie that just erases my whiteboard of sin when I decide to confess it just so I can turn around and fill that whiteboard up with sin again the next day. And there's always this level of shame in my life. Wouldn't you rather today come to him not as a cultural Christian? Wouldn't you rather come to him today in true repentance? In true repentance for your sin and find the absolute grace and mercy and forgiveness that, that only he can offer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity today to open your word once again. And Lord, to study just a little bit today about uh, this amazing ordinance that you left for us to do. And Lord, I pray that every time we participate in it, every time we think about it, Lord, that we would be reminded of the grace that pervades it from beginning to end. Past, present, and future. And Lord, may it always be for your church, that place of unity. Lord, maybe when we can't agree on on everything else, we can always unite around the gospel and around you and what you have done for us and your purpose for us. So Father, today, draw your church together. And Father, I pray today that if there's anybody out there today that, that what they really need to do today is just confess that they've been away. And just confess that, Lord, through all of the challenges of life right now, they've drifted away and they've let sin and struggle and bad attitudes and all kind of stuff creep into their life. What I pray today that they would hold on to that verse, blessed are those that mourn, and that they would today mourn over their sin, be broken over their sin, so that they might be comforted by your great grace. So, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time you've given us or continue 
to watch over your church, Lord, as we press ahead, uh, seeking to do the things that you've given us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, all right, guys. Thank you so much again for letting us into your home. And uh, we sure appreciate uh, you week after week doing this. Again, if you'd like to participate uh, in the Lord's Supper, if you're watching on Sunday morning, uh, 6.30 tonight at the Atoka campus, you can come and you can do that. That's a mask-only service. And uh, we would love for you to do that. So love you guys. Thank you so much for for, uh, praying for us. Uh, Staff still needs your prayers in a lot of ways. And so we love you and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.